I, I do want to thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. It's uh, it's an absolute uh, pleasure. You know, well, well, Canadian support for uh, the military is is tremendous. It's uh, it's high, and, and you know, a number of us remember times when perhaps it wasn't so high. Uh, those I would offer that have uh, you know a true interest or or a knowledge of all things defense and security related are. are sometimes hard to come by. Uh, so to be in a room of people with a genuine interest, genuine experience is, is an absolute honor for me. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, introduce uh, Brigade Sergeant Major uh, Mr. Crab, uh, Chief Warrant Officer Crab, who's over in the corner, and my PA Mike Forrestal. I'm a Patricia, uh, PPCLI, so apparently I have to have two Strathconas with me at all times. <laughs> um, so I, I just flashed this up. You, you don't need to read it. I, I can't read it. But uh, this is a slide I, I put together when I first came into the job. Um, and uh, you may ask why, you know, what, what, what do we really need to define? Uh, the reality is that the Canadian Armed Forces, and it's probably no surprise to anybody in this room, uh, across the board, uh, was really focused on a very different threat set um, than we are now. So we talk about, uh, you know, the, the potential of, uh, of a, a sort of a return to the Cold War. Um, currently, one CMBG has got soldiers deployed uh, across the globe to, to coin a, uh, a phrase used by General Vance, uh, we sprinkle Canadian confetti all around the world. So our flag is flying in a number of places. Right now, 1CMBG is the Army's high readiness brigade, which means we are called upon to deploy uh, soldiers for whatever uh, eventuality arises. Uh, so just off the top of my head, I can name uh, Kuwait, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Congo, Ukraine, uh, Poland, and I'm probably missing a couple in there where we've got uh, some small components. Uh, so in a brigade of about uh, 4,300 people, you know, at any point in time, I've got well over 1,000 deployed, uh, surging up to about 2,000 at its peak. It's, it's not an insignificant amount of, uh, of effort to get ready for that and then to sustain and support them while they're over there and their families uh, while they're back here. Um, you know, throughout all of this, uh, the reality is that I believe from a, a national context that uh, our Five Eyes relationship, all right, that's sort of the, the Anglosphere, I guess, of, uh, of like-minded nations, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Great Britain, and the U.S., and NATO remain our primary uh, international alliances from a defense and security perspective. We could talk about NORAD and some other things bilaterally, but uh, multilaterally, I think those are the most important. So I'd like to focus uh, in a little bit on NATO. Uh, again, no surprise to anyone in this room, I think that a few years ago, uh, NATO was, uh, if you you know, believe some of the pundits looking for a raison d'etre, trying to find out, uh, you know, they didn't need to defend against the Russians anymore. So, uh, you know, they were looking at optimizing uh, the uh, potential to deploy forces abroad and really looking at a, a counterinsurgency or a small war concept, much like uh, we encountered in Afghanistan. Uh, and the Americans found themselves embroiled in over the course of Iraq. And frankly, you know, to a degree, what we're doing now in, uh, in, in Iraq again. Um, that all changed. Right? Uh, and I think it's not really hard to put a finger on it necessarily. Uh, it changed when Russia uh, illegally annexed uh, Crimea. And uh, that uh, obviously put Europe in particular into uh, a bit of a tailspin uh, with uh, you know, some significant concern, particularly on the part of the Baltic states. Those who uh, had lived Soviet occupation and who still had very fresh memories of what that meant. Uh, so I'm talking about Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, to name a few. Uh, the same concerns exist on the Southern Bloc in Romania. Uh, there are nations like uh, Georgia, uh, as an example, who are trying to get very close to NATO because because of uh, their concern over the course of the Russian threat. Uh, at the same time, uh, we've all seen the, uh, the horrible pictures of the refugee crisis coming across from uh, North Africa, Middle East, and the impact that had on Southern Europe, which also had an impact clearly on NATO. So I think NATO found itself in a bit of a, an identity crisis with uh, sort of a very shrill uh, articulation of the threat to the east, say Russia, and uh, a bunch of nations sort of down to the south uh, who are actually more worried about uh, the impact of uh, the refugee or the, uh, the immigrant, uh, migrant, sorry, uh, crisis that they'd found uh, washing up on their shores. So uh, very significant. At that time, I was actually special advisor to the chief of defense staff, so I was one of the peons who sat at the back of the NATO roundtables, and I can tell you it made for some very interesting discussions. All that is to say that uh, there was um, a collective desire across Europe, I think in particular, uh, to, uh, to want to know that, that North America was still in the game. Uh, by North America, we mean principally the U.S. I think we can all recognize that, but uh, you know, importantly as well, Canada. 
so the transatlantic link, as it's talked about in NATO, uh, is important, and they wanted to know, uh, as Russia would try and shut it off if they actually moved into Europe, uh, whether we were actually, uh, you know, had skin in the game and, and were willing to come to their aid. So Canada responded uh, by deploying uh, troops forward. Uh, we now have missions in Europe as a result of that. Uh, it's not, you know, back to the four brigade days I would offer when we had permanent stations, but it's been a persistent presence of Canadian soldiers on the ground uh, with our allies in Europe ever since. Uh, and we are, I'll talk through it in a minute, uh, in the process of constructing a task force Europe. So, so what for one brigade, I think so what for the Canadian Army. Uh, we had a generation of people who were very good at uh, small unit tactics, very good at counterinsurgency operations, uh, operating in amongst the people, but had perhaps lost some of those baseline skill sets that served us so well through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and that's tank infantry cooperation, maneuver at battalion level, integration of artillery and engineers, and all those bits and pieces that really put together uh, the true combat power of a brigade. A renewed interest in having brigade headquarters at my level train under a divisional contract. We, we don't have divisions, it's not in our DNA. We, we've got one, but it's, I shouldn't say that, there's the general in charge of it, but it's not a real division. Um, the Americans have real divisions with all the, uh, you know, the, the, the high level enablers that those entail. Um, so that is really the renewed focus of the Canadian Army and has become our center of gravity. So that has driven this. Uh, and that's driven us to go back to basics and start looking at um, the importance of cooperation of all the combat elements in the brigade together to achieve an effect. At the very lowest levels, I know it's been a huge project of the Sergeant Majors, is going back to those things that will enable us to survive on a battlefield against a near peer or, in fact, a, an enemy that, uh, that overmatches us from a technological perspective. Uh, cam and concealment, uh, being able to disperse, uh, being able to control our emissions, um, and I'll, I'll talk about the threat in a minute and, and some of our experiences in there. What is the threat? All right, so this is uh, looking specifically at Russia because I'm going to talk to you about Europe, I think, which is going to be uh, a significant focus for the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, <laughs> providing the government doesn't change things, which, which certainly they, it's in their purview to do um, over the course of the next little while. But equally, when we talk about this threat, we could talk about China, we could talk about Iran, and to a lesser degree, we could talk about North Korea in terms of the capabilities, right? We can talk about the geostrategic stuff if, if you want to afterwards. Um, so the Russians, all right, uh, you know, we, we can have debates all day about uh, what their actual intentions are, uh, but the reality is that they have a very flat decision-making cycle. Um, there's one guy in charge, as far as I'm able to figure out, and he issues the orders and everybody else kind of jumps to and does it. We live in a democracy, not that simple. Um, far preferable, all right, but uh, it doesn't take a lot to paralyze government decision-making uh, when you work in a democracy where, or in NATO, uh, where consensus is the way to work. All right, so uh, the Russians have the ability to react far faster than we do, I think is the bottom line. They have significant capabilities, and I've, I've heard it said that um, for the last 10 years, while we were working on trying to defeat the Taliban, the Russians were actually working on trying to defeat us. So they watched what we were doing over in Iraq, they watched what we were doing around the world in Afghanistan, and they started uh, their, we call it force development, but crafting their force, creating their force to beat us, NATO. So they have invested heavily in unmanned aerial systems, significant, significant numbers with significant capability, both on, uh, from a visual perspective, but also the ability to transmit information back, which then allows long-range artillery fires to be vectored in in, in very short order. Uh, the lessons learned from the Ukrainian conflict, the Ukrainians lost entire battalions in a matter of minutes uh, because of one unmanned aerial system that flew overhead that they could not interdict. Um, it, you know, it, it's significant. They have uh, all sorts of long-range artillery, uh, they've got uh, all sorts of tanks, and uh, they've got a very mature cyber threat capability. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, uh, they are not afraid uh, to, uh, to use, I, I we'll call it inf it's information war, but basically all the, all the methods at the state's disposal to, uh, to spread innuendo, to spread propaganda, to, to get their message across. And I'll show you some real-world examples aimed at us already. We haven't even deployed yet to Latvia uh, in, in a moment. All right. So what have we done? Uh, we have created what we're calling Task Force Europe. Uh, so that will be a, uh, a task force level headquarters commanded by a colonel based in Riga, Latvia. And that's a stood up essentially right now and it will be responsible for the, uh, the coordination of all operations in the European theater, all right? So not a brigade a la uh, once upon a time four brigade during the Cold War, but uh, certainly a command and control node that's gonna help us out. What have we done since then? Well, we've got uh, two broad components, operations in the Ukraine, uh, that's under the auspices of what we call the Multinational Joint Commission, which is uh, Great Britain, UK, US, uh, it's not NATO. Uh, and now we're calling that Op Unifier. 
I'll talk through that. And we've got NATO Opry Assurance, which is the big one, uh, currently morphing from what it currently exists as into the EFP, the Latvia battle group. Uh, and then we've done Baltic air policing, so that's sending our CF-18s over to, uh, to police the skies over the Baltic nations. We're looking at doing southern air policing as well, which is principally based in Romania. Icelandic air patrolling, Iceland doesn't have a standing force, so NATO uh, surges forces in to, uh, to assist them. Uh, and uh, various NATO training initiatives. A couple of years ago, Trident Juncture, I believe was the name, was the largest NATO exercise in recent memory. Canada was in in a significant way with I think over 1,500 troops, uh, a submarine, a ship. Uh, significant and, and we contribute to that and that's all that stuff is designed to send a message to uh, potential adversaries. Uh, part of ROP reassurance I should mention obviously is a, a maritime a presence, a standing maritime pre presence in the Mediterranean uh, with the standing NATO maritime group. Uh, and they've surged up into the Black Sea, much to the chagrin of everyone in Crimea um, as part of NATO and it's, it's, it's a, a significant endeavor. Okay. So Operation Unifier began in September uh, 2015 it was really uh, a way to, uh, I guess, voice our displeasure at Russia. I mean, this is Bill Fletcher's opinion. I wasn't in cabinet when the decision was made, but th this is my read of it. So take it for what it's worth. Um, so it was an effort to, uh, to uh, assist uh, Ukraine's with responding to the threat, uh, specifically the annexation of Crimea and then the, 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 the conflict that currently exists in the Donbass region or I guess all along the, uh, the zone of separation in the, uh, the east of the country. Uh, they're based about as far as you can get from that uh, line of conflict, um, but uh, more Canada in this case is actually a good thing. Uh, so uh, Ukraine has uh, NATO ambitions uh, and to do that they have to achieve certain NATO standards in terms of their training and they were very keen on Canada, the US and Great Britain as the first uh, big three uh, to come in and, and build their capacity. So to teach them how to do business the way NATO does business and that's everything from baseline weapons handling drills to small unit tactics to some efforts uh, to try and professionalize the senior NCO Corps uh, to uh, some anti-corruption efforts at the, at the senior senior levels uh, aimed very hard high in government and it's a, it's, it's a really interesting mission. We just had uh, received 200 soldiers back from two PPCLI uh, last month and 200 soldiers uh, comprised of the headquarters and a bunch of elements from the Lord Strathcona's Horse supported by two PPCLI are in theater now uh, training uh, the, uh, the Ukraine forces. There's a bunch of lines of effort on this which is a you know a fancy military way of saying ways to do things. Uh, we're doing the training, uh, the conventional training of their forces. We're doing medical training which is very well received and has saved lives lives uh, of Ukrainian soldiers on the front lines. Military police training to try and professionalize their, their military police cadre. Used to be the guy with the big stick who would just hammer people and now they're actually looking at, uh, uh, at the ethics of, uh, of uh, being a peace officer. Uh, logistics, uh, flight safety, a whole bunch of things you wouldn't necessarily think of that are having a market impact on, uh, on the, uh, the professionals of the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, the evolution of the mission now, uh, so it was our guys delivering the training. They've now stepped one back and it's actually the Ukraine Ukrainian, excuse me, uh, cadre delivering the training under the mentorship and oversight of our soldiers. So that is uh, a significant movement of yardsticks over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, they're taking ownership for their own training and they're doing it based on the lessons that we've taught them. I'm particularly proud of the senior NCO development uh, uh, initiative that was really started, I think, by one brigade soldiers. Um, so we have a very healthy concept in Canada of the command team, right? And that's, uh, you know, an officer and a senior NCO. Um, the officer, I guess, kind of being the pointy head, big brain, except in my case. And the senior NCO being the technical expert, right? The backbone of the Canadian Army. And those two work together uh, to, to provide leadership and produce, uh, produce results. That didn't exist. The senior NCO was really the toughest, baddest person in the, uh, in the unit who just managed to rise to that uh, particular level and kept everyone in line um, with, with a big fist. Um, that has now changed. Uh, they are starting to see command teams at the unit level. Uh, and uh, again, this was a low level initiative that has borne fruit and is now taking on a life of its own and I think is going to stand them in very good stead over the course of the next little while. The government just re-upped this for another three years, I believe, uh, so uh, we're not leaving the Ukraine anytime soon. Uh, we are starting to stage out of our current base uh, further into the country now uh, to try and take training to where the troops are as opposed to bringing the troops to us, uh, which will make things much more efficient for them as they, they still work their combat rotation through uh, the eastern portion of the country. Okay. This is just some cool photos because I know it's torturous to listen to me. 
Um, so, you know, uh, our guys learn as much from them as they learn from us. So I would offer that the Ukrainian military has more experience fighting Russians than anybody else right now. Uh, and they've learned a lot of the lessons that uh, we are learning through simulation. They're learning in real life, like the, the value of cam concealment, uh, the ability to, uh, to, to move and communicate without significant electronic emissions. Uh, you know, so our guys get to do some of this stuff as well. Uh, you know, it's a bit ironic that we're training people to use Soviet, Soviet equipment. It's, uh, it's kind of different. I didn't think we'd be there necessarily when I joined the Army, but uh, here we are. Okay, next. And one of the big ones I didn't mention is an engineer line of effort to, that's dealing with unexploded ordnance disposal and uh, counter IED training. The IEDs the Ukrainians see are really booby traps uh, planted by, by little green men. Uh, it's not, you know, the big giant IEDs we would have experienced in Afghanistan or the Americans would have experienced in Iraq. A very, very different set. So our guys are learning a great deal. Canada provide them a bunch of uh, uh, robots. Operation Reassurance. This is really, I guess I would call the flagship of Canada's engagement and certainly one brigade's main focus over the course of the next little while. Um, this has been happening um, I think since uh, it was early 2015 uh, when we staged, essentially picked up a company which is about 150 you know, folks uh, at a Petawawa, I believe at that point in time, or was it the 3rd Battalion? 3rd Battalion. So here out of Edmonton and said just get over to Europe and start doing good stuff and that, that was kind of the orders they got. So they got on a plane, they showed up, they had no vehicles, no anything, uh, but they just started finding training opportunities and they started integrating with our NATO allies and starting learning how each other did business. Uh, and that was really, uh, it was called reassurance, the NATO operation was called NATO assurance and it was about demonstrating again that Canada had skin in the game, that we were going to be there for you uh, and that uh, you know we were ready to bleed with our, our European allies if it came to it. So this was really about, you know, assuring uh, specifically the Baltic states, uh, you know, that the North American transatlantic link was alive and well. Uh, we've been there persistently ever since on essentially six to seventh month rotations at company level, again about 150 folks. Uh, we now have some, uh, a bunch of trucks there, a bunch of Jeeps, uh, some stuff has surged in, uh, but it's still very much a light infantry task, so guys are, are, you know, digging holes and shooting rifles and that's principally what they're doing. And they're just finding training opportunities, NATO training opportunities or bilateral training opportunities uh, all around the country, and they've seen a lot of, uh, of NATO. They're based in Poland right now, uh, and are, you know, living pretty well there, but uh, when they train, they train hard. You know, we just got a company back from one PPCLI here in Edmonton and deployed a company from three PPCLI also here in Edmonton who are there now and who are responsible for transitioning this mission into what we're going to call Reassurance Roto 8, and that's going to be the evolution to the Latvian deployment. Um, so we are moving from assuring our allies to deterring Russia, uh, full stop. That's the purpose of this thing. Um, so there are a bunch of sort of high-level things that are going on in NATO. Uh, you know, uh, Sakur, um, who is uh, you know the overall uh, strategic commander for, for uh, NATO forces, Supreme Allied Commander Europe, um, has uh, you know the ability now with what they call a, a very high readiness joint task force, the VJTF, to have standby forces ready that he can deploy around Europe um, on fairly short order, and we've got small command and control nodes all throughout Europe that can take these things in, begin to resupply them so that they can actually operate when they show up. Um, for us now, uh, this is the transition to the Enhanced Forward Presence Battle Group concept. So there are four of these across NATO going in. Um, there's the UK, who's going to take the lead in Estonia. There's the Germany, who's going to take the lead in Latvia. There's us, who are taking the lead in, uh, sorry, uh, Germany's in uh, Lithuania. Us, who are taking the lead in Latvia. And uh, the US, which is in Poland. Um, Canada is sending about 450 folks based out of uh, 1st Battalion, Princess Patricia Canadian Light Infantry here in Edmonton. They'll deploy June-ish and be there for as long as it takes, but we expect to have them home around Christmas time, probably a six to seven month tour. And they'll be replaced by elements likely out of 2 Brigade in Petawawa who are training in Wainwright right now. Um, 450 soldiers does not a battle group make. For those not familiar with a battle group concept, it's, uh, it's normally about uh, anywhere between 1,000 to 1,500 folks and comprises all the various combat elements uh, into one organization so that it's got uh, service support, supply, logistics, uh, direct fire, indirect fire, communications, engineer support, all those bits and pieces resident in one component. So what are we sending? Next slide, please. Um, so you, know, you can't have a military slide without this, uh, but we are sending uh, a headquarters, uh, a uh, uh, national support element, which is all the, uh, the experts, supply, uh, transport, mechanics, all those bits and pieces that are required to ensure we've got what we need and the stuff we have there continues to function. And we're sending an infantry company based on Lav 6s, which is the new variant of our light armored uh, vehicle, uh, upgraded 
optics system, fire control system. It's a big beast of a vehicle and not something to be taken lightly. For the first time now, we're going to have LAV 6s, armored infantry in Europe, and that's a significant escalation from where we were from a Canadian perspective. Joining us, it's, it's worth noting that this is the most multinational enhanced forward presence battle group of all of them. So most of them are two, maybe three nations. As you'll note here, uh, we've got a whole bunch. So we've got a tank battalion, or sorry, a tank company coming from Poland. Uh, we've got a, an Italian infantry company, we've got a Spanish infantry company. All those elements will have their own service support components. I believe it's uh, Slovenia, uh, who's uh, sending a small element. The Czechs are looking at uh, Czechos, or sorry, the Czechs are looking at a potential uh, a contribution as well. Um, so um, the only thing worse than going to war with allies is going to war without them. So this is a huge strength. So it's going to be very difficult to knit all this together uh, when we actually get into theater, which is why we. You know, picked a bright young star, CEO of, uh, of one uh, PPCLI to do this. Uh, he's had a chance already to meet with all the commanders. Um, clearly, these nations are not going to send uh, pinheads, right? They're going to send their, their best and brightest uh, into harm's way and to work with the Canadians. So this is a, a phenomenal, a phenomenal opportunity for our soldiers to head forward and see how NATO does business. And I think it sends a very powerful message to any adversaries that uh, NATO can work together. Um, we can do this. And, and uh, you know, it may be a bit of a sleeping beast, but if you awake it, you'd better watch out. All right, next slide. So these are some, uh, again, some cool photos over the course of reassurance. Uh, you know, it, it's funny, Army guys love being on the water. Uh, I don't know why they didn't join the Navy. I don't know what it is, but it's strict as, uh, as we're here in a Navy wardroom. Okay, next. If, if that were me, I'd be climbing over one of the at a time. So that's uh, clearly a young soldier who's got way, way more energy than the... Uh, than brains. Okay, next. <laughs> yep. All right. If you look off to the left, you know, there's the helicopter. When I was a young anti armor platoon commander in 2 PPCLI back in the early 90s, uh, those were the very vehicles that all our recognition packages were designed to, to detect so that we could uh, figure out who the bad guys were to destroy them. Uh, and now we're operating alongside with them. I, I should have mentioned that the, uh, the Poles, uh, as they show up, the, the Polish uh, tank uh, company is coming with essentially uh, former Soviet tanks that have been upgraded. Uh, so it'll be very interesting. Yep. Right. Um, so this is, uh, you know, a guy firing a weapon system that, that we don't have. Uh, again, another tremendous opportunity to, to experience uh, various components that are out there across uh, the NATO alliance. The Russian threat is tank heavy. They have a lot of, uh, their brand new tank is a T-90 and it is a technological marvel. Uh, the Russians operating them aren't near as good as our guys, but they've got a good tank. Uh, so we need to be able to destroy it, is the bottom line. Next. So, you know, um, some people may say it's Canada. Does Russia really care? Uh, it's not Canada. It's Canada as part of NATO. This is uh, the Russian insider, uh, mostly taken off uh, some blogs that came off the back of it from yesterday. Uh, it may be uh, difficult for you to read, but uh, uh, they make fun of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Wade Rutland, who's CO of one PPCLI, talking about some of the R&R &R opportunities or some of the force protection elements that'll be uh, <coughs> inherent in that. Um, you know, uh, so you know, we may do some cultural excursion, excursions. Uh, you know, we're with a NATO ally. They want to show off their country. Uh, what heroes look how stupid they used to be. Uh, we've now entered a better world, that's for sure. Uh, these Canadian whatever, it's irrelevant. Canada's not even a real country. Um, Canadian troops in Latvia, it's nice to know the continuance of the policy of provocation is alive and well. I wonder what the reaction when 10,000 Russian troops are stationed in Mexico will be. Uh, they still have the Queen on their money and the Governor General to remove a government that gets too uppity. Uh, though that hasn't been a problem since 1837, so someone doesn't know their history either. Uh, can Yanks they are, they all have uh, surfed in all wars. Uh, surfed the United Kingdom as can of fodder in World War I and II. Surf the U.S. and Korea. I didn't know surf was a verb, but uh, I let Canucks go to surf the U.S. and uh, Vietnam. Uh, they surf the U.S. as a poodle state, and they're weak, arse, robbed, and gouged uh, by the B.S. great con called NAFTA. So um, apparently, someone has noticed. But uh, th this is serious business, I guess, at the bottom of the line. You know, the, the risk of strategic miscalculation is significant. Um, so, you know, the, the interactions at sort of that strategic level, which is, is not my purview. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a tactical guy, and uh, we're going to go do our business, and we're going to be ready to fight and win if we need to. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, it is a, uh, a significant situation in which we find ourselves. All right. Next. Um, so what was the future going to hold? Um, so the defense policy review, some of you actually may have been involved in the consultations that went into that. If you know anything, please tell me because I don't, I don't have a clue uh, what's coming. And, and I guess uh, it would be great if it came with a whole bunch more stuff, but, but I don't know. The one thing I would posit, and this is really only a guess, is that I don't think it's going to materially change um, our priorities, you know, which are really going to be defending 
Canada and Canadians, uh, being uh, assisting with the defense of North America, continental security, right, and uh, you know, engaging, uh, being le leadership abroad, which is kind of the, the three overarching strategic frameworks we operate under now. I don't think that's going to change, uh, but we'll see. I, I don't know at the end of the day, and uh, we'll see how that comes out. Domestic response, so we're sending all these guys and we've got a very focus clearly on the very, very dangerous situation that exists, the powder kegs that are around the world overseas, uh, but we are always ready to respond domestically, right? So you guys have seen about 1,700 soldiers right now in Quebec and uh, Eastern Ontario assisting. Um, we've heard uh, yesterday from British Columbia that they're concerned about the potential flooding there uh, and have given us, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, so we have our immediate reaction units. Those are units uh, fueled up, stood by, loaded, ready to go on a moment's notice. We hold one in Manitoba and we hold one here in Edmonton so that we can reach across Western Canada uh, to have an effect on the ground and support of Canadians. And that is our primary purpose, uh, bar none. So I said, uh, we don't need to go into this, but uh, you know, the, the, the technology on the battlefield today is significant. Uh, we're really good in some areas. Uh, we're lagging in some others. I think that's probably true of any military, but uh, we need to figure out how uh, to close that gap. All right, and that's, we got really smart people who do that kind of stuff. Uh, NATO's not going anywhere, I don't believe, and I don't think Canada's support to NATO is gonna change. Uh, you know, we'll see what the release, the release of the Defense Policy Review followed on its heels by the NATO summit with the Prime Minister's going on to what, what happens there. Um, you know, and our, our, our allies, uh, Canada is unlikely to go to war on its own, um, just by our very nature and by, thank you, the size and capability of our force. Uh, so we will always operate with allies. So it's important for us to have those relationships established before. You don't want to do it under fire. You want to have your things, things ironed out uh, ahead of time. And last, we're for peacekeeping. I don't know. Um, so we were on standby. We were ready to go. Uh, the government deferred their decision. Uh, that, that's okay. Uh, I think peacekeeping, something will happen, Africa-ish. I, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, but when it does, uh, you know, the Canadian Armed Forces will be ready. Probably at this point in time, the, the soldiers at a Petawawa and two brigade, uh, based on, on where we are in our terms of our deployments. Uh, you know, but uh, it, it is not certainly from a, a, a prudent planning perspective, it's, it's not a dead idea uh, from a military uh, standpoint. And, uh, you know, you look at the bottom there. So once upon a time, all my photos were guys in desert uh, uh, disruptive pattern uniforms, you know, patrolling in the Kung Fu position, ready to go. I think the photos you're going to start seeing more and more in the future are tanks and labs and heavy mechanized forces maneuvering together in support, which is a little bit of back to the future. All right. So I, I think I've probably talked enough. I hope that provides a little bit of an overview of where certainly one brigade sees uh, the Canadian Army and involvement in Europe. <laughs>